you got an American accent. <laughs> I, I do, but just for that part. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to another one of our MAG uh, educational specialists, educational sessions I talk today. Today, we have the very lovely Dr. Jeffrey Rosenberg, who's worked with MAG for at least five years. Uh, he is a respected orthopedic surgeon who uh, has an extra specialty in the area of spinal surgery, but he's also CIRA accredited to do lower limb and he does a lot of knee replacements and all sorts of other exciting surgeries himself. For the past almost 15 years, he has also regularly participated in humanitarian missions to the Pacific with orthopedic outreach, uh, which is amazing work. And we are very proud of him for that. He's also done some work in Africa with Australian Doctors for Africa. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg does a great report. So uh, if you're ever thinking of booking somebody for an IME, keep him in mind. He consults via both telehealth and face-to-face -face from our Sydney rooms. May I ask that you all please keep yourselves on mute while the presentation is happening. At the end of the presentation, there'll be plenty of time to ask questions and you can unmute yourself to do that there. This recording will go to our YouTube channel as usual. And for those of you who've registered and attended, you will get sent the email of the presentation afterwards. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you very much for your time today. All right. Hello, all. Um, I, from what I gather, you guys are lawyers, case management, uh, or case officers, work with insurance, stuff like that. But if you don't understand what I'm saying or if you have questions, feel free to, I'm assuming they appear and I, I can talk to them. This is rather than a didactic lecture, um, this is more sort of a stream of consciousness and stuff that I've thought about having done this for a few years. So Michelle told me that several of you guys had asked for certain things. So to do with, for instance, this is all to do with WPI, whole person impairment training, when range of motion is not an appropriate method of assessment, using an analogous condition, if you think you can't use range of motion, and then a bugbear of mine, the obligation for assessors to give reasons. I don't have a problem with that fundamentally, but sometimes the way it's worded. So I've got examples of all of this and I'll, I'll talk to it. So I can understand, and the people who put all these guides together in the assessment of whole person impairment are far smarter than me and far more patient than me. But particularly for upper limb, it seems that by and large, it's range of motion. Whereas in the lower limb, you can get away with a lot of the time doing DBEs, diagnosis-based estimates, but even that, is not quite enough because it doesn't cover everything. Um, so, for instance, neck problems, okay? So spine is easy, I should say. Spine is easy because you don't use range of motion. You use it as an absolute last resort. I've never actually used it in five years. You can, you know, ascribe DRE sort of ratings to it. I guess it's probably easier for me in the sense that I primarily do spine surgery. So I sort of can read through the lines rather than just, yeah, they got a lot of pain. It doesn't make sense. So spine is easy, but it's when you get lower limb and upper limb. So for instance, with neck, just about everyone with neck problems gets a referred pain to their shoulder, but they sort of say, oh, it's my shoulder. That's not your shoulder, that's your neck. But it's sore in the soft tissues around, their, around the shoulder. So they have limited mobility, depending how much they're bunging it on. And I'd like to think I've seen a very very few crazies, probably the figures of one hand in over five years. Um, so even though they've got restriction of movement, there's absolutely nothing wrong with their shoulder. And even so far as they might have had a normal MRI, or this is the other bugbear, like everyone investigates. And basically, you guys for the insurers are paying for this, but ultimately everyone's paying for it. You know, sore shoulders or this or that. And the number of people who come to see you and they've had sort of an innocuous injury but they got total body pain and they've had an MRI of every body part. And then 40% of things you see on an MRI or on any scan done anywhere for anything are incidental. They're there, but so what? So I'm an old bugger. I must have some rotator cuff pathology in my shoulder. I might have a little tear, but I'm asymptomatic. And yet, sadly, a lot of people have their snouts in the trough. And I think there's a certain degree of over-servicing. And what that leads to as well a lot of the patients think they're really sick because they've had an operation. 
And then they just go on this roundabout. And this has only come to me this year, in the last few months, actually, a lot of this. Um, certainly my understanding with spine is there's certain surgeons in this state who never, ever, ever get anything approved unless it's vetted by at least one or two other people, um, which is probably not a bad thing, but you don't want to put up the gates too much and make it too difficult because you can't tar everyone with the same brush, but I'm rambling. But um, so just because they got shoulder pain and restriction of movement, I personally don't think you should ascribe them in WPI. And I put that in the report. Uh, the worst example I saw of this was someone who I saw several times a few years ago through MAG. And this woman it was patently obvious. She had a significant injury at work. It was a cervical spine. She had a disc, got a referred pain to the shoulder. And yes, she had restriction of movement, but there was nothing wrong with the shoulder. It was because it hurt all the soft tissues in her cervical thoracic region. She had an MRI, which is normal. However, the shoulder surgeon convinced work cover and the patient that she had all these problems with her shoulder. And lo and behold, she had all this surgery, the usual labral repair and debridement, rotator cuff repair, biceps, tenodesis, yada, 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 yada. And you know what? She wasn't not better. She was worse. And in fact, she had less movement. And so if you were going to assess her for WPI of the shoulder, which remembering that there was nothing wrong with it to start off with, she's even worse. And yet fundamentally, so I struggle with this concept. And uh, the only way to assess her is loss of movement. Um, and she's even worse. And yet she never had anything wrong with it. So it's an inexact science. I, I, I wish, you know, the obvious thing is, all right, then, smarty pants, what can you suggest that's better? Well, I can't. I can't. Because we all know pain and suffering attracts nothing because it's too subjective. You can't measure pain and suffering. Um, say someone with an arthritic knee, they might have had a partial medial meniscectomy that attracts two thirds of nothing. Menisectomy, medial or lateral partial, 2% LEI, 1% whole person impairment. But now they've got pain, their only option is a knee replacement, but they've got near normal range of motion, which often happens. So even though they've got all this pain and they've got near normal motion, which happens in practice anyway, they've only got a double 1% WPI. I accept that lower limb attracts very little, but uh, compared to upper limb, but uh, it just, doesn't seem quite right. So range of motion in that instance, I mean, it's useless. It doesn't help you at all. Um, ankles. I've seen a lot of ankles lately. And God help you if you've twisted your ankle, sprained your ankle, and you go to a foot and ankle surgeon, because they will always say you've got instability, you've got a syndesmosis injury, you open up, yada, yada, yada. So you come and see these people post-operatively. They might be better, but they still have residual pain. They don't feel unstable, but their pain. And I saw one just like this today. And how do you assess that? So her range of motion is the same. She's lost a little bit of inversion. But other than that, there's nothing. She has the same dorsiflexion and plantar flexion as the other one. So then, all right. And she has no wasting. So if she did, I'd use whichever attracted more. So then you go to diagnosis-based estimates. So go to that on page 547 of the guides, which, of course, you all have open. Ligamentous instability based on stress x-rays. Not once in my, in my time of doing medico legal stuff have I seen a stress x-ray with a report saying, yes, opening up. You really just get the surgeon saying, yes, the ankle feels unstable, uh, opening him up to a varus force or in an AP, they've got an increased AP draw. It's not numerated or anything. So I can't use the DRE. So really, the only thing I, I've got to use, they got no wasting. They don't have anything accessible by DRE. Uh, they don't have arthritis on their x-rays, but most of the time they don't have x-rays. You just got a report. And the reports never, ever, ever say, yes, left ankle appears normal, but there's two millimetre of articular height. Not once in my career, let alone my medical legal career, has a report specifically said that. So, you know, it's imperfect. So range of motion doesn't actually reflect how bad they are or not are. Similarly with hips, um, everyone, I mainly do spine, and everyone with lumbar spine problems, you, you've got them on the bed, you're stressing their hip a bit, they go, ah, and they fight you a bit. But there's nothing wrong with their hip. So, you know, I tend to ignore it. And um, a lot of the times when there's real dispute, um, there's, uh, you know, what's the word, disagreement about how bad they are. 
and causation, um, you know, I don't know that they necessarily embellish it, but they just go out of their way to tell you everything that's wrong, where it hurts, and so you've got to examine them. Um, and you find they might have lost a bit of range of motion, but really I don't think there's fundamentally anything wrong with them. So whilst it's an easy thing to do and it can be quite objective, in the guides, you know, and they decide that in, in, imperiously, if you think it's inconsistent, you should examine them on two or three occasions. Who's got the time or the money to afford that? And still a lot of these people work as well, so they're not going to keep taking time off to do it. I mean, it's easy when they resist you. You know they're bunging it off. Um, so that's sort of my blurb about range of motion. That I, I wish I could regale you with a better system I have, but I don't. I don't. But range of motion, sure, it can be objective, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Um, so, which is sort of partly answering an, an analogous condition. Well, there is really no analogous condition. I mean, with the lower limb, it's great if you could look if they fall into a DRE category. But like I said, with the ankle ligament injuries, which everyone seems to have if they sprain their ankle and they all need surgery, um, the, the DRE just doesn't help you unless I'm missing a packet page or something like that, but it just doesn't help you. Similarly with uh, fractures, uh, uh, I've seen a few people with heel fractures who have incapacitating pain, uh, but they have reasonable movement with their sore. Um, and once again, they talk about with various angulation, with this, with that, they've just got a fracture, it's intra-articular, but it's not angulated, it might be crushed down, but it's not angled. So that doesn't quite tell me the whole picture. So you can have an intra-articular fracture, say, of the subtalar bone, only if it's displaced. What if it's not displaced? They still can have symptoms and loss of movement, but it doesn't attract anything. So it's hard. It's hard. I, I don't, I'm not criticizing them, but you know, the more I do this, the harder I find in some instances. And sometimes I'm I'm often asked, you know, do a supplementary report, this, this. And I just say I find it hard to ascribe any problems. Yes, they've lost some movement in their shoulder or in their hip, but in, empirically, I don't believe there's anything wrong with it. So I can't ascribe any WPI to something in, in that instance. Um, my real, but the one I can talk to a lot is the obligation for assessors to give reasons. What I'm at pains to, to, to tell a lot of the people, I mean, officially I'm not meant to talk to them, but you know, I give them some information stuff so they don't feel, particularly the ones who are here on behalf of the insurer, not their own lawyers. You know, just tell them a rough thing, what's going on, what's reasonable, what's not. And I explain to them, it's not that the people at work don't believe you, it's all about liability. Is it on them? So a guy I just saw today, has had two knee replacements. He's uh, through work cover. I said to him, well, it's good luck to you. I mean, you've had it already. It's a miracle. You can toss a coin, but you don't get arthritis by just getting up and going to work in the morning. But anyway, he had it, and the lawyers just wanted him assessed for WPI, so that was easy. But um, this uh, secondary reasons, secondary injuries, that's right. Um, you know, it stands to... Oh, okay, I had a stress fracture in my foot. I had to wear a, uh, one of those moon boot things, which everyone said, oh, you've got to wear one of them they give you a leg length discrepancy. You can't move your ankle. So I got shin splints on that side. I started to get a sore back because my legs were not the same length and my other side used to hurt a bit. But the occupational physicians and rehab guys will say quite adamantly in their literature, and I've seen it, no, just because you got a sore left knee and start limping and your right knee sore, that's not a secondary injury, it's just bad luck. And I tend to agree with that. I tend to agree with that. There's one guy I saw just yesterday who's had a... He had a shoulder injury at work and he probably had a neck injury at the time, but he failed to mention that. And different reports suggest that that came on later. And one of my colleagues has sort of said, because his left shoulder is problematic, he's now developed an overuse thing on his right shoulder and now his neck is problematic. It's just nonsense. You know, I just don't ascribe to that at all. Um, I think if you injure your left shoulder, you injure your left shoulder and that's it. That's it. Um, there's someone else, a secondary injury, uh, this is uh, another favourite of mine. Someone with a PARS defect and a spondylolisthesis and a degenerate lumbar sacral disc. And that's present in up to 5% of the population. And yet 5% of the population aren't walking around in crippling pain. Um, 
so this one guy, he, work, he he used to be a personal trainer, but works at Qantas, and he's the guy at the check-in counter. Occasionally, he'll do an air bridge attaching to a plane. He doesn't bend. He doesn't lift. He doesn't do anything heavy and physical, except in the old days as a personal trainer. He just stands and walks. Everyone does. You don't get symptomatic from that. So I said it's nothing to do with work. And yet other people have that and work in a heavy physical job. And um, they work in they get occasional back pain then they have one big accident like they fall down the stairs or the ladder collapses and that renders them symptomatic and they never get better um the other thing is too with work cover with all this stuff it's always easier if someone has an injury like i bent down to pick this up felt a rip in my back and i've had problems ever since and yes a lot of the time something like that happens but a lot of the time it doesn't happen that way um they just gradually get symptoms slowly but surely and suddenly one day, oh, it's killing me. My back sore or my knee sore or whatever. And that's quite an acceptable thing to happen. It's often a bit harder for the patients to sort of get that acknowledged, but I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, so I said about secondary injuries. I said about... Um, yeah, and so this goes to do with uh, the obligation for assessors to give reasons because it usually, it often is a gradual onset or someone's been working on production line or processing line, bending, lifting, twisting for the last 20 years and they just gradually get more and more pain until suddenly they're bad. But there's never one incident. So, you know, and often you get questions, well, how has this happened? Uh, why didn't they mention it earlier? Most people do the, people do the right thing. And don't so. I mean, yes, there are boys, people who cry wolf, and the moment they get a tiny twinge, they just report everything. And other people don't until they're finally really bad, and they're the ones who get trouble, even though they're genuine and tried to do the right thing. Um, one of my favourites, because I don't understand it, is this an acceleration, an aggravation, or a deterioration of a pre-existing pathology? I wish someone would explain to me. I mean, I'm married to a lawyer, but I just don't understand his. I mean, the law and medicine sometimes, I mean, the law wants it to be black and white and grey often, and medicine, it's often grey. Um, it's not as black and white as the law. But I don't understand. Uh, I see that regularly with monotonous regularity. And I just say it's all of the above. Um, the other thing is too, like, would this person have been, become symptomatic at this state, time in their life, in any case, they're 30 years old and got a big slip disc after a lifting injury. Of course not. And you feel like saying, duh, but you, you can't. So you answer it politely and as appropriately as you can. But, you know, you, you, you see the patient, you take a history, you examine them. If you're seeing them, you have radiology to look at. I always try and access the radiology rather than rely on reports because in clinical practice, if you're dumb enough to do spine, I pay a king's ransom and indemnity. And my attitude is if I don't see the x-ray, it doesn't exist because they miss things. They sit in a dark room and usually they just have the history saying back pain. I've talked to the patient. I know what I'm looking for, but I'm not so arrogant that I don't then look at their report just to make I'm sure I'm not missing anything. But, uh, you know, so then you offer an opinion and they say, well, how did you reach that conclusion? Well, I've seen them for a report. It, it, sounds, it seems a bit brain dead. Um, you know, why is it on work? Well, the patient said they never had a problem until they fell down the stairs at work. Uh, so therefore, it's a work-related injury. Uh, and it's quite obvious. Well, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm a smarty. I just don't know. Um, the other one about treatment. Once again, uh, uh, giving reasons for the treatment. Um, considering the following. All alternatives, that's fine. But they might have failed non-operative measures being sim highly symptomatic and getting worse. The effectiveness of the treatment, I'm talking about surgery now, the cost effectiveness, and is the treatment accepted by the medical profession as appropriate? So, and we're not talking about a brain transplant, we're talking about doing a discectomy, doing a laminectomy, doing a knee replacement or an arthroscopy. It just seems a bit trite to be asking a question like that. Not sort of Certainly not suggesting the arrogant surgeon knows best and everyone else has to listen, not at all. But some of these questions are a bit dumb. Um, but it all comes under this obligation assesses to give reasons. So you don't have to believe everything we say, but 
you would hope that most people just it's evident that they reach conclusions by taking a good history, doing a good exam, using the available uh, investigations and studying them, and then reaching the conclusion, but then having to say it again, oh, well, it's because I did this, this, and this. I mean, it's an easy thing to put in a, in a report, but it seems a bit ridiculous. Um, and, and really, I'm, I'm giving you examples that I've seen just recently, just recently as well. In fact, this week, there was one guy, I love this one, okay, give reasons. So this is a self-employed um, installer and manufacturer of curtains and blinds. He's worked for himself for over 30 years, had a disc injury about 15 years ago, had an operation. Still his company, he still works there. He can't do as much as he used to, so he's got a younger guy on board. But the big issue, trying to apportion blame, because he changed the name of the company, which was in his own name initially, and then they formed a family trust. And obviously the accounting advice was get rid of this. The company is under the umbrella of his parent company, which is called something else. But it's still him doing the same thing, same insurer. And yet this insurer wants me to ascribe blame when he was working for John Smith, as opposed to now he's working for Fred No. But it's the same thing, just crazy. So I couldn't do that. Um, uh, it's, it's almost like they're trying to catch me out or catch him out or anything like that. But uh, some of these things. So it's sort of really, I've just been rambling a little bit about certain likes and dislikes. But um, I mean, do, do you guys have any questions? Have I bored you witless? Have I just, I've, I've not tried to make this into a rant, but <laughs> this was never going to be a didactic lecture at all. Um, uh, Jeff, I, I um, will open up the floor to questions, but I just, what you were just saying um, reminded me of a, an interaction that you and I had a couple of months ago about a client. You came in here for a full day of assessments, and I remember you talking about the paperwork that you'd, you'd read the night before or whatever in the days before in preparation for these. Uh, weeks and, before, weeks before, studied it assiduously, yes. Studied it, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I remember you saying to me, I've got two very interesting ones today. One of them, I'm sure there's absolutely nothing to it and they might even be making it up. And the other one looks pretty nasty. I'll be interested to see. Mm. And you came out at the end of the day and you said, wow, you know, based on the reading and based on the questions in that letter of instruction, these people, it went nothing like I thought it would go. Yeah. In actual fact, the one that I thought could be bunging it on has got an awful, awful ongoing injury and he, no one seems to be believing him. And then you said, and as for the other one, it's nowhere near as bad as the, you know, and I remember thinking that's the value of having the independent specialist talk to the person and match it up to what is what the questions are being asked and what the evidence is. And and you basically just said that sometimes it just doesn't match the person's presentation. Well, that's it. When I first started doing this, I used, my head used to sink because you're reading these things about you think they're miserable. Seriously, get on with it. And I've got to say, I've hardly seen any miserable, crazy people in, in five years. Most of them, a picture, it's like a picture says a thousand words. Um, you read something expecting to see some miserable ne'er-do-well, and they're 100% genuine. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the other dilemma I find, because officially I'm not meant to give advice, I could offer an opinion, but when I see people who are offered surgery that is patently inappropriate or not going to help or possibly make them worse, particularly with the spine, because I, as an orthopod, I mainly do spinal fusions because that's what I see. And yet there still is a bit of a clash with neurosurgeons who do spine. I mean, most of them are very good, but sometimes they'll always have a bit of a nibble or they'll do this or do that. So I saw one guy, I was very concerned, he had four operations, he still had problems, and I thought he had ongoing problems because, as he did, and he needed this. No, 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 his treating surgeon thought it was the level above and was going to do a disc replacement. And I actually got quite distressed, and I rang the lawyers, and I said, well, you know, what do I do? And they said, we're not interested. We're not interested. We just want to offer an opinion about the previous stuff yeah really hard really hard right. it wasn't you know the surgeon wasn't being negligent but i think he was barking up the wrong tree completely mm. crazy yeah. hey we've got a question here from pia pia would you like to ask your question you could unmute yourself to do that 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, I've got a question. I work in, um, in, I guess, essentially a closed shop in terms of liability and permanent impairment, uh, running claims for veterans against DVA. Mm -hmm. And liability uh, is governed under the MRCA by statements of principles, legislative instruments. And often um, with uh, these instruments, the date of clinical onset can be a hurdle to liability. So, for example, a meniscal tear requires a trauma to be sustained, you know, at the date of clinical onset. So you, yeah. you tear your meniscus, there's clinical onset. Uh, the difficulty is if a veteran doesn't claim it for, you know, some period of time after. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not evidenced on imaging until, you know, let's just say two years later. Yeah. And um, so in order to, uh, I guess, enhance prospects of success, if we make recommendations to uh, the client, you know, you'll need an orthopedic report to, yeah. to support causation. Is there, so can the doctor uh, review the imaging and say, oh, yeah, that looks like a historical tear? Is no. there anything else? So there's no evidence of, Not unless really. there's maybe like, degenerative change? Uh, possibly. If they have a cyst, usually you don't, when you tear your meniscus, immediately get a cyst. A cyst is pathognomonic of a medial meniscal tear and means it's been there for a while at least. Uh, but once again, it's not like, oh, it must have been there for at least a month or a year. I, I just don't know the answer to that. I understand what you're asking, but based purely on the radiology, no, no. It's more the history. Okay, thank you. Unmuted. Uh -huh. Does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask of Dr. Rosenberg? Come on, I'm not scary. Ask me something. Nikki, uh, would you like to ask your question? You can unmute yourself to do that. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm just curious about um, the the whole person impairment, the percentage that is given. Um, and you were mentioning that it's really just an assessment of the a person's kind of range of motion. Um, does it translate? into anything else, like in terms of their function or, um, yeah, can you can you shed some light on the percentage okay. and what? So, so good question. There's an allowance for ADLs, activities of daily, of daily living, only to do with spine, okay? So the fact that someone might have hurt their knee or their ankle and they used to run, they used to go to the gym, they used to play uh, touch footy and can't do it anymore, tough. Um, there, there's nothing you can measure with that. It's only to do with spine. And it's only either 1% uh, if they can't do outside yard work, 2% if they can't do the housework, but most blokes fall into that, and 3% if they basically can't attend to personal hygiene. And you add that to your assessment. But it's not pertinent or relevant or able to be used. The other one I find amusing, apart from this, because I go to Canberra, you get some vets to come to Sydney, and they like you to use, the latest one is Comcare 3. Uh, I complained to one of them, they wanted me to use Comcare 3. I said, I don't have it, so I can't. So they sent me a copy, which is very nice. But there's something called Table of Mains. And I looked about Table of Mains, and in all the stuff I am able to access, it says, it's not relevant after 1990-something or 2000 or something like that. Anyway, this guy insisted. I said, listen, I'm not meant to use it. So I used uh, just the AMA guides. And he said, no, 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 you've got to use this. I said, all right, send it to me. So he sent it to me. And this is just pie in the eye stuff. Um, maybe it isn't, but uh, legally, but to me. And, and it's all about uh, just describing a percentage in the worst-case scenario. And, and this guy was quite, you know, he, he was quite nuts and had total body pain and total body stiffness. So I just sort of randomly selected 10% for one thing or whatever. You know, it, I mean, it's completely unscientific. Um, but this is the only time in, in all my time I've actually had to use the table of modes, which took me a while to understand what you're meant to do. Um, but once again, even that, 
it doesn't really, I guess, yeah, I, I guess I, I, I to answer you, Nikki, um, it allows you a little bit of leeway if they happen to be under Comcare or from Canberra and, you know, how it affects their function, social, sporting, recreational and otherwise. But other than that, I've only, that's the only time I've used it and that was recently. And other than that, it's just, no, you can't. So you have to use hard, objective things. Um, how do I, this is from Jessica Noyan. How mm -hmm. do I deal with, uh, well, there's not a crossover from other people because you can only do ADLs pertinent to the spine. D does that answer your question or not? Nikki? Sorry, this myself again. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. And then there, there was another one, but it disappeared. Yep. From Jane. So from Jessica, uh, uh, Jane says, arthritis and relativity of this with TKR in respect to being work-related, please. Yeah. I mean, I fundamentally truly believe you don't get arthritis by getting up in the morning and going to work. If you fall down the stairs and have a massive intra-articular fracture, yes. But you know, part of the aging process and, and you see these people, they present to you because I, I still work, uh, you know, you get someone who twists their knee or falls down the stairs, they've got a profoundly arthritic knee, never heard of me, never had a problem in my life until this accident, Doc. <laughs> it's just nonsense, I don't believe them. But, you know, I just say in the lap of the gods, I just sort of say, if the patient is to be believed or from their version of events, they claim to have minimal to no symptoms, now they have all these symptoms, in the absence of this injury, they probably would have needed surgery, but not for the foreseeable future. So this accident and incident at work has been a major contributor to their problem, but not the complete contributor. So then I leave it to the insurer to fight out. But I personally believe you shouldn't get a knee replacement or a hip replacement unless you have a fracture. Uh, you know, uh, it's work-related in that instance. Otherwise, it's not. It's not. I had one guy operated once in his back and 50% was paid by his health fund and 50% by work cover. And everyone was quite happy with that. But it's, wow. it's hard. It's hard. And, and once again, you've got to be a pain to these people. It's not that we don't believe you. It's all about liability. Who, who, who's responsible for it, for you and your treatment? Right. Okay. Any more questions? We've got some thank yous there for you, Dr. Rosenberg. All right, I've got one question from somebody who's not been able to attend today, and that is they wanted to know your opinion on um, encouraging, this is from an insurer, insurer's case manager, the value of encouraging people to persist with more conservative treatments such as physiotherapy, et cetera, before going straight to surgery? Great, great answer. Um, uh, great question. And hopefully it'll be a great answer. Um, surgery is a last resort. Surgery is when you can't manage. If you're able to manage and put up with things, put up with it. I'm a last resort. I'm talking about spine. I'm talking about knee, hip, anything. In America, it's a completely different mindset. They treat the x-rays, not the patient. And in America, everyone wants to be a spine surgeon because it's lucrative, it pays a lot more money, and everyone wants to have operation as a first-line treatment, Which, whereas in this country, most people would rather chop their arm off than rush to a back surgery. Sure, you've got a gigantic disc, you're screaming in agony, you're, or, or you know, you've got progressive weakness, whatever, that's a no-brainer, yes, straight to surgery. But most of the time, non-operative treatment. This triggers something that I, I always remember scientifically none of the modalities be it physiotherapy chiropractic osteopath massage what sort of massage acupuncture wet needle dry needle please explain the difference to me um you know stuff like this has been shown to make a difference except a short burst of physiotherapy with acute back pain and it's not that these things don't work but you can't get 100 of you with the same problem and send 10 for this, 10 for this, 10 for this to make an observation. The reality is if it helps, if you go to whatever and they do whatever and it helps, that's good. If it doesn't help, don't go back. But these things are going to, uh, it's not like you need to keep doing it, like you need to keep having needles, you need to keep taking drugs for blood pressure. You know, within a short period of time, it should help. So I'm always in a dilemma. I, well, I'm not really, but um, people say to me, 
well, you know, years down the track, oh, I still do physiotherapy. I said, seriously, if I was paying for it, I wouldn't pay for it anymore. Uh, it's not making any difference. It's like going and having a haircut. You sort of do it out of habit. It's not physically doing anything. Or over to you, Freddie, I'm big on personal responsibility. You've been shown this. Surely now you know exercises to do. So, yes, uh, it's not that you must keep doing this. People have it in their head. Oh, I got the flu. I couldn't go to physio for two weeks and now I'm worse. That's just complete nonsense. Um, you know, so these things help. And they're reasonable to do for a certain period of time. But I reckon being generous after three months, that's it. It's either help or it hasn't helped. Or if you've paid attention or you're genuine, trying to help yourself, you know what to do, you can do it yourself. All right. Mm -hmm. but, so would you say would you say then that the value of the money that would have been spent on these allied health therapies would be better off spent on, say, a personal trainer or a regular fitness uh, arrangement for the, for the injured person? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's personal responsibility. I mean, most, most people have half a brain and they can get instruction for a couple of weeks in exercise and then bloody well go and do it themselves. I tell everyone. I mean, I had a period of time 15 years ago, I didn't see one person who was worse than me with my back. I just lost a bit of weight, swam and do Pilates. I've been doing Pilates for 12 years. What's Pilates? Look it up. Look it up. Oh, will insurance pay for that? No, why should they? You do it. You do it. Um, you know, so I, I think there's too much credence on that. Um, but I'm not saying the surgeon is the only one who can help, not at all. But I think these things really, there needs to be a timeline and then that's it. Oh, they've cut my physio off, now I'm in agony, or they've cut my this and I'm in agony. It's just nonsense. It's psychological agony, but it's not physical agony. I just don't believe it. But in a long-winded way, my, my response to the question is, 100%. Empirically, you should not rush into surgery unless there's an urgent need to do it. So I hear there's a certain hospital not too far away from where I'm sitting in town where there was a couple of surgeons there who used to say, you have a big disc protrusion, you've only got pain, but you might go home, bend over, cough, sneeze, roll over the wrong way, and a huge protrusion can come out and you could be paralysed. And the patient now is a quivering wreck and amazingly, there's been a cancellation on their private list the next day. You know, they, that's just rubbish, rubbish, really bad, yeah. bad behaviour. So conservative, conservative is a bad term. We, we sort of prefer these days to use non-operative treatment. Non-operative treatment is reasonable, but only for a certain amount of time, not forever. And it's not, it's not up to you guys, the insurers, to be paying for lifetime physio and lifetime this year lifetime that year. The other thing is too, that triggers a memory. Sometimes the insurer gets a bit narky. So you get people, a lot of people from overseas, like my parents, and these people are there, they're injured, but their mother's dying back home in Macedonia and they want to go on a plane. And I have one insurer query, well, how bad they can they be if they're sitting on a plane for 15 hours? I said, are you suggesting they're bunging it on and they're off on a holiday? Their mother's dying. No, they have to do it. And so it's not like they're a prisoner and they're condemned being in agony doing nothing. Um, yeah, understood. That's a good point. Mm. Well, look, that has been really, really interesting. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for everybody who made time to join us today. As I said before, you'll get the recording uh, hopefully later today, but possibly tomorrow. Um, and if you have any further questions for Dr. Rosenberg or you forget anything, please feel free to reach out to me and I can see if we can get those questions answered for you. And we look forward to seeing you at our next seminar. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Have a great rest of the day. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.